Welcome to Right Away Maintenance, uh, brought to you by the South Carolina LTAP. I'll be your instructor for the webinar today. My name is Todd, Todd Morrison. And again, we're going to be talking about right away maintenance. And the objectives today are going to be to understand why right away maintenance is important. I'm going to show you some of the guidance that is available to help you. We're also going to talk about strategies for maintaining our right of ways, give you some tools that you can actually take away and use. So let's start with the first thing, and that is why is this important? Why is right of way maintenance important? Really, it comes down to looking at crash data. Uh, to me, right of way maintenance is one of those items that we can do uh, and that can actually have a huge impact on the number of fatalities, roadway fatalities that we have. All of us want to have a, a safe and efficient transportation system. Good right away maintenance allows you to figure out how to spend those limited dollars. So let's take a look at the data. In 2018, South Carolina had 1,037 fatalities. And as a nationwide total, all of the United States had 35,000. And I've had this map up for a little while because I wanted you to take a look at the map, see if you could find your county on this map. And maybe you're in the county that's red and it has 56 plus. Uh, that's definitely not good. Maybe you're looking at that though and you're thinking, hey, we're dark blue, we scored six to 15. Again, that's not good. Or maybe you're looking at the light blue and you're thinking one to five, hey, that's awesome. One to five, we're at the low end. I got to tell you, though, one to five is still significant if you're one of those individuals, if you're one of those one to five, or if you have a family member that's one of those one to five. And good right away maintenance can help bring these numbers down. To me, that's why it's important. Um, and that's not even counting the injuries. That was just fatalities. Sometimes people don't always walk away from these crashes that we have. Sometimes they last a lifetime. You know, they permanently injure them, they're in a wheelchair, they lose a limb, they lose the ability to have a good quality of life. And if there's something that we can do in our right of way maintenance to reduce injuries or fatalities on the roadway, then by all means, I think we need to do it. So how can good right of way maintenance help bring down those crashes? Well, let's take a look at this chart. This is also based on 2018 data, 2014 through 2018. And we find out that in, out of those over a thousand crashes that we had that led to fatalities in 2018, over half of those were single vehicle. But let's take a look at four, five, and six. Four, five, and six, actually the ones that to me good right away maintenance can have an impact on. Number five is involved in a roadway departure. I mean, somebody left the roadway for one reason or another, and there are a lot of human factors involved there, but over half of those fatalities involved someone leaving the road, roadway and getting onto the right of way. And again, right away maintenance can reduce the severity of those. They can turn them from fatalities, maybe into injury, from injury into property damage only. About a fourth of that number involved a rollover. When we talk about rollovers, we're talking about steep slopes normally, or maybe something we've placed on the right of way that snagged the vehicle and flipped it. And so again, good right of way maintenance can prevent those. Number six says involved in an intersection. And again, almost a fourth of those involved an intersection a fourth of those fatalities, right away maintenance can have a huge part to play here as well. Here we're talking about opening up those sight triangles. We're talking about making sure that we can see our stop signs, our stop ahead signs, et cetera. And so that's how that is involved in, in right away maintenance. And I want to look at really three areas based on that crash data. All right, so we've built the case for why it's important. Now I'm going to look at some of these strategies. 
I say, how can right away maintenance help? One, it can keep the vehicles on the road. Remember over half of those were roadway departure. Two, it can improve intersection safety. A fourth of that thousand, almost, involved intersections. Three, it can create a forgiving roadside. And that involves those rollovers, as well as those roadway departure fatalities. And that's the areas we're gonna break it up into and look at today. We'll start off with keeping vehicles on the road and improving intersection safety. Now, when we talk about both of those, right away maintenance can help with good vegetation management. And it's critical to bring in those numbers down to help keep the vehicle on the road so we can see our signs, the ones that give instruction to the motorist, the stop signs, the intersection ahead, the curve warning signs. It's also important uh, for sight lines at curves. That helps keep people on the road. It means that they're not gonna drift or cross the center line when they go through that curve or somebody is stopped on the other side of the curve, they're gonna have a chance to slow down, come to a stop before they slam into them. It improves intersection safety because we're gonna be looking at sight triangles at intersections and I'll throw in a bonus and look at them at driveways as well. And that means keeping the right of way clear, maintaining it for those sight triangles. Hopefully your signs don't look like the one in this photo, partially covered or maybe all the way covered with trees or some other type of vegetation. Maybe like this one. Here's a stop sign that really isn't doing anybody any good. So if this was a stop sign that was in your city, that was in your county, we would want you to cut that vegetation away so that the stop sign could be seen. And for me, I retired from the Department of Highways and while I was there, whenever I'd send the crew out to say, hey, let's go ahead and make sure we can see all of our signs, the first thing they would ask me is, how much do you want me to cut? How far away do you want to be able to see it? And that brings me to the first book that we can use for guidance in right-of-way maintenance. This is Vegetation Control for Safety. It comes from the Federal Highway Administration, and I highly encourage you to download a copy of it if you just go to your favorite search engine, type in vegetation control for safety, it'll pop right up. You can download that as a PDF. But as you read that, you'll find a chart in there that says, here's a clear distance to see a sign. And this is what the FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration suggests. And it breaks it down into critical signs and non-critical signs. The critical signs are any that might require you to stop. So that would be a stop sign, yield, one way, do not enter, wrong way, even the intersection ahead sign. The one that's showing you a side road or intersection ahead indicates that there's limited sight distance. Somebody might pull out in front of you and you're gonna have to lock it up to bring your vehicle to a safe stop. So what is that distance? How do we use this chart? Let's take the example of 30 miles an hour. At 30 miles an hour, we would go to the chart where it says 30, read over to the type of sign. Let's say it's an intersection warning sign. We'd get the number of 250 feet. That means we need to see that intersection warning sign at least 250 feet away, more if possible. And that's a clear distance to see signs. Uh, again, that is gonna help with bringing down these crashes, bringing down the fatalities, and it's a good strategy for right-of-way maintenance. The next thing I wanna talk about right-of-way maintenance-wise are curves, and specifically the inside of the curve. Here we've got a curve where the inside of it is completely covered with vegetation. And that's a problem, because if someone is driving down the roadway and there's someone broke down on the other side of the curve, they're not gonna be able to see them. You're not gonna be able to come to a safe stop. You're gonna to have to either slam into them or swerve off the road, one of those roadway departures, to avoid hitting them. And also we find that if people can see around a curve, if they see someone coming, they are more likely to stay in their lane. There's less drifting as you go through the curve. So we wanna remove this material on the inside of the curve. Well, the question is, how much do you remove? 
And the answer is really you, re you remove a minimum amount, but oftentimes we're limited by right of way or utilities or some other item that's in the way. So that might limit us, but we're going to remove a um, minimum amount based upon the stopping site distance. This chart also comes from that vegetation control for safety. And as we check out this chart, it says required stopping site distance. We have to really know the speed limit. So let's say that we're on a uh, city street, got a curve coming up. The curve is covered up in vegetation on the inside. We want to open that up for site distance. And the speed limit is 35 miles an hour. Then in that case, the stop in sight distance is 250 feet. And that's how much we want to clear or be able to see around that curve. Now this chart also takes into account grade. So if you're going downhill, as you come into the curve, it requires more time to stop. If you're going uphill, it doesn't take as long. So where is that 250 feet measured from? That's a great question. That 250 feet is going to be measured beginning at the curve. This is the, the POC, or the beginning of the curve, the point of curvature, where the straight part of the roadway meets the curved portion. So right where the curve begins, you're going to have an individual sit there, and they're going to have a stick or a sight tool that is is painted, if it's a stick, it's painted orange up to the three and a half foot line. I've also seen people use PVC pipe that had a hole drilled in it at the three and a half foot line. And that is there because that's the standard height of the eye of a, a driver in a passenger vehicle. So you're trying to simulate what that driver sees. Then if this was 35 miles an hour, the stop in sight distance is 250 feet. So someone's gonna go around this curve and that distance, 250 feet, is measured on the roadway because that's how long of a distance they have to stop. Not straight across, but on the roadway. When you get to 250 feet, this individual is going to have a stick that is marked at the two-foot line. Now, it's marked at the two-foot line because it's trying to symbolize where the, the uh, standard height or represent where the standard height of the brake lights would be on a vehicle. So it's simulating a vehicle that is stopped over here on this side of the curve. And they're going to sight through from three and a half feet to two feet. And if they can see that, then you have good sight distance. If they can't see it, well, then you don't have adequate sight distance. And we need to take out or remove as much as we can. That's right away maintenance for clearing around our signs, vegetation management. It's also right-of-way maintenance for clearing on the inside of the curve. The next type of vegetation management we'll talk about is site triangles. Here's an intersection where if you're trying to turn left out of this roadway, and you have a very difficult time seeing. We've got all kinds of stuff in this site triangle. And it looks like to me from the beautiful flowers that you may have some trouble taking this out. So you might have to be able to prove that this is actually blocking sight distance. And so I wanna show you how to do that. In that same manual, Vegetation Control for Safety, they have a simplified approach. And I want you to look at just the departure sight triangles. All right, the departure sight triangles means that we come up to an intersection, we stop, and now we're gonna depart the intersection. That's not as long or not as big as an approach site triangle would be. But I'm assuming we're going to have stop conditions that's most common in South Carolina. So we're going to look at a departure site triangle. And as a person pulls up and they stop, let's say I'm going from the bottom of the slide up to the, the top. So I'm heading from south to north. When I get up here to the stop sign, I can go straight across. I can turn left or I could turn right. The way the vegetation control booklet does it is it says in a simplified analysis, we could just look at that left turn maneuver. That's going to generate the most need for sight distance, and we could use that for both directions, left and right. So in this example, let me show you how to do it. We'll say that on the main road, the one that does not stop, 
the one that goes left or right, the east to west route. Let's say the speed limit is 45 miles per hour. On the north-south route, the speed limit is 35 miles per hour. And the north-south, the minor street stops, the main street does not. Well, how you would measure the site triangle or determine what that would be is you would first get take a position that is 15 feet back from the traffic on the main road or where the traffic's running on the main road. The reason it's 15 feet back is this is uh, supposed to simulate where the driver's eye would be again. Most of the time we don't go all the way up to the intersection roadway. We stop a few feet short of it. If you have a crosswalk, you're gonna be even more. And then you have the hood of the vehicle as well. So this is supposed to simulate where the driver's eye is. Some books will say 10, but in the vegetation controls for safety manual, it says 15. So you'll take a position 15 feet back. You'll have that same stick that is painted up to the three and a half foot line. Then you're going to send someone down the road this distance B. Now where do we get that distance? Well that comes from this table. Again, out of the vegetation control for safety booklet. It says intersection side distance. ISD for left turn from stop. Our speed was 45 miles per hour on the main road, so that's what we're going to use. That means the intersection site distance is 500 feet. And that would be that distance B. That individual would walk down the road 500 feet. When they got to this point, they would also have a stick that's painted up to the three and a half foot line. Because again, you have a driver coming down the main road, you want to simulate where their eye will be. They would sight down this line to where this individual is standing. Their stick also painted up to the three and a half foot line. If you can see it, then you have enough sight distance. If you can't, then you really need to open up that sight triangle, if at all possible. If the right of way will let you, or if you have enough right of way, if the political concerns will, will also allow you to, we clear that out, we open it up as much as possible. Now, I do want to share with you how this is different than stopping site distance. That 500 feet is called ISD, intersection site distance. That means that if we have 500 feet, then if you were to turn left out of this intersection, then you can actually get up to full speed without anybody coming down the main road having to stop for you. They don't, they don't won't even have to hit the brakes. They can continue going down the road. You have plenty of time to get up to full speed. What we looked at earlier uh, for the curve was stop in sight distance. And if we only had stop in sight distance here, that would be a smaller number. And that would mean that if you pulled out in front of somebody, they might have to lock it up to avoid hitting you. And that's what we use for driveways. So if you're listening to this webinar and you're with permits or you're a uh, county road foreman or a city street superintendent and you're in charge of deciding whether someone can have a new entrance onto your road or to your city street, then really you want to be looking for stopping site distance. For driveways, we don't use intersection site distance unless it's a commercial driveway that is a large traffic generator. You know, if Walmart were to come in or Target or Lowe's, there we're going to try to get intersection site distance. But for your ordinary household, we're just looking for stop in site distance. 55 miles an hour, that would be uh, 495 feet. 35 miles an hour, it'd be 250 feet. So we could use this chart, the stop in site distance chart that we used earlier for the curve. And so let's take the number of 55 miles an hour. Say it's a county road. Your county engineer sent you out and said, hey, these people want a new entrance. They're building a house. Make sure they have plenty of sight distance. With the speed limits 55 miles an hour, you want to make sure that they have at least 495 feet. You would take a position in that driveway 15 feet back. Uh, you would send someone down the road you would make sure that they go down the road 495 feet. You could do it that way. You could wheel that off. You could use a truck odometer, or you could use seconds. 
I've done this before where I sent two people out. The first person would stay in the driveway, the other would get in the vehicle, and then they would head down the road at highway speed. And in roughly six seconds, you will cover 495 feet, it's just a little bit over six seconds in a vehicle at 55 miles an hour. So if there's something blocking sight distance, we want to take it out. And really we're thinking about things that are three and a half feet or higher or 7.6 feet or lower. And that 7.6 feet symbolizes where the, a driver's eye is in a commercial vehicle or a school bus or something like that. So anything in between there, three and a half to 7.6 feet really needs to come out if at all possible. Now what I gave you was a really simple analysis for sight triangles, and this can be modified for steep grades. So as people are going downhill, it takes longer to stop. Remember that? So you need more intersection sight distance. If the road is skewed, it doesn't come in at 90 degrees, then you're gonna need more intersection sight distance. If the major road has more than one lane in each direction, it's gonna take you longer to cross, so you're gonna need more intersection sight distance. Now, if you have a lot of commercial vehicles, we also make allowances for that. If any of this is present, give us a call at LTAP uh, or contact a traffic engineer. We'll be happy to try to help. So what do we find in these sight triangles? Well, all kinds of things. Uh, we, bushes, shrubs, sometimes buildings, fences, Slopes, a lot of times, are the, the issue. Cars parked on the street or in the right-of-way. Cities are responsible for what, what they allow to park and where. Uh, at intersections, we have to be careful to make sure no one's parked and blocking sight distance. Here's a bank that's blocking sight distance. This is one where I don't think we could do a lot because it's going to take a lot of money to move those utilities. I don't think I'm going to be able to cut that bank down, but maybe on the main road, I could put an intersection ahead warning sign. And how about this? Signs that people put on your right-of-way that block sight distance. So we talk about right-of-way maintenance. We're also talking about removing items that people place that shouldn't be there. Ideally, we wouldn't have anything on our right-of-way but especially we don't want it there if it's blocking sight distance. And when these political signs have been involved uh, in the past, I've had to really be careful and prove that they were blocking sight distance oftentimes before I removed them. And so that's how right-of-way maintenance can help keep vehicles on the road by opening up to where they could see the signs that were given them for warning or for guidance or let them know the need to stop. It can also help by opening up those curves on the inside. And then it can help with intersection safety by making sure that we have sight triangles. Now the next portion of how that right-of-way maintenance can help and why it's important is it can help to create a forgiving roadside. So what is a forgiving roadside? It says that when people leave the road, and remember over half of those 1,037 fatalities were roadway departure. When people leave the road, for whatever reason, that roadside has an environment that's free of fixed objects. A fixed object is something that is firmly embedded in the ground and is strong enough to cause serious injury or death to a person when they hit it. It doesn't yield, bend, or break away. It's not crashworthy. So free of fixed objects and with stable flat slopes. Remember about a fourth of those were rollover crashes as well. These are the numbers that we had. Out of that 1,037, over half involved a roadway departure, about a fourth involved rollovers. And again, that typically occurs on steep slopes or maybe we've built something on the right of way that is too strong and is sticking up enough that it snags the vehicle. So what guidance do we use? 
This is the manual. It's the Roadside Design Guide put out by Ashto. You can use your favorite search engine. You can find this. You can't download a PDF free of charge, but you could definitely purchase one. And as we're looking at this guidance, um, it's important to remember that it's a guidebook. It's a little bit different than the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the MUTCD, which has been adopted as South Carolina law. But this is just a guidebook and it's something that we can use. But to be honest with you, on the maintenance end, we're probably not ever going to be able to hit exactly the targets that are set in this manual. So what we do, our goal, rather than trying to hit the design standards, our goal is to make the roads as safe as practical. So we use this as a guide. We use this to set our goals and our targets. And then we just get as close as we can to it. And in this booklet, it tells us uh, a little bit about something called the clear zone. And when I talked about having a roadside that's free of fixed objects and has flattened slopes, well, we want to have that for a certain distance away from the edge of where the traffic's running, away from the roadway. And that distance is called a clear zone. And this booklet tells us how much of that is desirable. And then again, we try to get as close to that as we can. In this diagram, you'll see the clear zone starts at the edge of the travel way. That's the edge of where the public's running. You know, that's the white line if you have it. That's the curb and gutter if you have that. And it's really there for a vehicle to come to a safe stop. You know, somebody leaves the roadway for whatever reason. Uh, maybe they were, maybe they made a mistake. They were texting. Maybe they had a some type of incident where they took their eyes off the road for a second. They were distracted by someone in the vehicle and they left the roadway. This gives them a safe area to come to a stop. Now it can be more or less than the right of way, uh, but it, whatever you own, if it's within that clear zone, we want to do everything possible to keep it free of fixed objects and to have flat slopes. So how much of a distance is a clear zone? What is that measurement from the white line out or from that curve face out? Well, there's a lot of factors that go into it. There's a chart that you find in the Astro Roadside Design Guide. And you'll notice it has speed, the ADT, the average daily traffic, and then the slope. The force slope is coming from the shoulder of the road down to the bottom of the ditch or if it's a fill section, it's going down to the toe of the slope. And a one to four means that it goes out four feet and down one. All right, so that's a one vertical, four horizontal. Sometimes we call that a four to one slope, but it's out four feet, down one. So let me give you an example of how you would use this chart. And by the way, the numbers range anywhere from seven to 10 feet for a, um, low speed, low traffic volume, city street or county road with great four slopes, seven to 10 feet, all the way up to 38 to 46 feet for an interstate perhaps. Well, let's take the example of 35 miles an hour, a thousand vehicles a day, and that four slope coming from the shoulder down to the bottom of the ditch or the toe of the slope is four to one or flatter. In that particular case, you'll see the number is 12 to 14 feet. And the clear zone would be 12 to 14 feet from the white line measured out or the curb face measured out. And that is in the straight or the tangent portion of the roadway. When we get to a curve, well, there's a multiplication factor that increases that 12 to 14 feet. And it depends on how sharp the curve is. It can get as high as 1.5. So that 14 feet might become 21 feet. And the reason for it is pretty simple. We assume that a vehicle is going to leave the roadway at a 15 degree divergence angle. So 15 degrees is where the north typical angle you're going to leave the roadway at. And with that, you're going to get a certain distance away from the road before you can come to a safe stop. But if the roadway is going away from you and you're leaving at a 15 degree angle, the roadway is also going away from you, 
then you're going to be further away from the road before you come to a safe stop. And that's why we have a multiplication factor for curves. So that 14 feet that we saw in our example, again, with a sharp enough curve, it would be multiplied by 1.5, and that would become 21 feet. But again, remember, these numbers are targets. Really, the goal is to get as safe as practical. Now, with that in mind, Many DOTs have selected a clear zone with rule of thumb of 30 feet. Now, why would they pick that? Well, at the bottom of that chart that I showed you, it says that you can use 30 feet as a rule of thumb. And that came from some research that General Motors did back in the 70s. And they found that 80% of the people could stop within 30 feet. So that's why it was allowed as a rule of thumb. But when we're talking about low volume local roads, Honestly, a more practical number for you might be 10 feet. If you could get 10 feet uh, with flat slopes, free of fixed objects from the white line or the curved face back, I think you'd be doing fantastic. And you gotta remember this is a game of, of inches and feet. If you have five now and you can make it six with some of your right of way maintenance, that roadway just became safer. If you got six and you can make it seven, again, that just became safer. And I want to let you know that uh, there are no reduction reductions in the Astro Roadside Design Guide for curve and gutter. You know, I've heard that before that, hey, we've got curve and gutter, so we don't have to worry about the clear zone. That's just not the case. And the reason for it is curve and gutter only has redirectional capability at very low speeds. You know, five, 10 miles an hour. But if you're going 25, 30, 35, 40, you're still gonna hit this tree, just like this individual did. So now we know what the clear zone is, and we know that it's a target or a goal uh, within that area. As I said, we want it free of fixed objects with flattened slopes. So how flat do we want the slopes? Ideally, the slopes are gonna be four to one or flatter. And here's a four foot level, that's an easy way to check it. It goes out four feet and it drops one foot or less. That's a four to one slope. And that's the ideal roadside slope because with that, individuals that get on that, not only can they ride it safely without flipping, they can also recover. They can actually get back on the roadway and go on about their business. So whenever possible, that's the kind of slope we create. And I often would have our guys when they were doing ditching operations, uh, when we had the right of way, utilities weren't a problem. I'd have them set the ditch point back further away from the roadway so that we could get a nice flatter slope coming from the shoulder of the road down to the bottom of that ditch. And if we didn't have room for that, then the next thing we tried to get was a between a one to three and a one to four. A one to three goes out three feet, drops one foot, that's still considered a traversable slope, meaning if somebody gets on it, they can actually ride it safely to the bottom without flipping or rolling. And because they are going to make it all the way to the bottom, in new design, we'd have a flat runout area down at the bottom. It's not going to be recoverable. They can't get back up on the road, but they won't be rolling. And remember, almost a fourth of that over a thousand fatalities in 2018 in South Carolina. Uh, were rollovers. And so this is one way we can prevent that with good right-of-way maintenance. Anything steeper than a one to three? That means very simply, there's a really good chance you're going to be rolling and flipping by the time you get to the bottom. And if there's water present, it makes it even that much more dangerous. There is another slope that I want to just call your attention to, and that's a transverse slope. Transverse slopes are perpendicular to the road, so they're at 90 degrees. Think about uh, driveways. This is a driveway. The main road is over here on the right-hand side. The ditch line is beside the road. And they've got a driveway where they have a headwall, straight up and down headwall. If I get off the road going 50 miles an hour and I impact this headwall, man, it's not going to be good. Not to mention these large fixed object columns that they have. So whenever we're really concerned about safety or new construction, sometimes 
we'll put a metal end section or a slope and flared uh, concrete box that's going to put this on a six to one or flatter slope so that then a vehicle, if they're going down the ditch line, they can actually ride up on it and safely cross this without flipping. And those are the flat slopes. Four to one, if at all possible, out four feet, down one. Uh, three to one, if you can't get that. So out three feet, down one. And we also, whenever we have the opportunity, we think about those transverse slopes or those coming in at 90 degrees. All right, so that's flat slopes within that clear zone. The next thing with right-of-way maintenance is what do you do with hazards? fixed object hazards, things that if people hit them, it could do serious injury or kill them. So let's talk about slopes being one of those. A slope is a hazard. When, once it gets to be steeper than three to one, that is a hazard for the public and also fixed objects. I give you a whole list there, but in this photo, let's talk about a few we see here. One, we have guardrail. And you're thinking guardrail, guardrail is a hazard. Yes, if it's substandard or installed improperly. This one has a sparing in treatment. It's also substandard rail. Uh, so if somebody were to, were to hit that, that would definitely be a hazard. It's not connected to the bridge wall, so this bridge wall is not protected at all. Uh, so that's a fixed object hazard. Somebody hits that, it's going to be bad news. There's a utility pole there. And I'm sure there are several trees that are over four inches in diameter. But all of these are fixed objects. So what do people hit when they leave the roadway that is a fixed object and, and then die as a result? Well, these are some 2018 US numbers. And we can see that around the United States, the overwhelming majority was trees. Trees followed by utility poles, traffic barriers, embankments. We also have ditches, culverts, fences, uh, traffic sign supports you know, if they're not installed and properly, guardrail and treatments. How about South Carolina? Well, 2017 was the latest numbers that I had. And there in 2017, about a third of their fatalities were fixed object deaths, 318. Out of those, the overwhelming majority were trees, 105 of those 318 fatalities. So what do we do with these fixed object hazards in the clear zone? Well, that Astro Roadside Design Guide gives us an order of preference. The first thing it says is we might remove that obstacle, and that'd be the most desirable. The order of preference is based on effectiveness. Uh, and I'm going to give you examples of the, each one of these. But first, we might try to remove it. If that's not possible, we make it traversable. If that's not possible, we relocate it further away from the road. If that's not possible, we make it of some kind of material that maybe won't kill them. Maybe it'll just be an injury or property damage only. Way down at the bottom is shield obstacle. That's guardrail or a concrete barrier wall. And at the very least, at the bottom, delineate the obstacle. That's talking about putting some type of sign up to warn the public that it's there. So I'm going to walk through that list with you. The first option is to remove it. Get it out of there if you can. And when we talk about removing the obstacle, trees is an example I wanted to use. With obvious reason, because a third of the fixed object fatalities in South Carolina involve hitting trees. The FHWA says any tree that is uh, four inches or more in diameter is considered a fixed object. And so we definitely want to get them out of there uh, we don't want to have any trees close to the road or in that clear zone if we can. So part of that means we're cutting those trees out for right of way maintenance. We're trimming back that vegetation. It also means that on the permits end, we're not allowing those things to be there in the first place for other people to place them on our right of way. And this is where I want to talk a little bit about mowing. A mowing program is essential for taking these trees out because it is much easier to take out the tree when it's the size of my thumb, when nobody cares about it, than when it gets to be a big tree, it's 
downtown and people are really concerned about it. So one of the reasons we mow the right of way is to get rid of some of these trees before they become a problem. Another reason is for sight distance at intersections and then aesthetics as well. So a good mo mowing program is essential to this. Another thing that you could remove are non-traversable slopes. Remember those are steeper than three to one, out three feet, down one foot. So whenever possible, you could build out those slopes. You know, we used to have a practice in our ditching operations where we would give dirt away if property owners wanted it. You know, we'd be out ditching. If I got a load of dirt, you wanted it, sign a consent release, hey, it's yours. We realized though, that was a valuable commodity. Oftentimes we could reuse that material on the side of the road. Maybe we had to let it dry out first, but eventually we could reuse that material on the side of the road to build out our shoulders, to build out our slopes, to make them safer for the public. And whenever we can, we should do that. Speaking of ditching, the way we make our ditches can have a huge impact on these crashes. Check out this ditch in the photo. This is what you'd call a non-traversable ditch. There's no way a vehicle's making it from one side of the ditch to the other side of the ditch. And so sometimes our ditches can have uh, slopes that are too straight up and down. Here's a diagram that shows you what the ideal slopes are or the ideal ditch for safety. And I'll point you down to the very bottom one. Uh, the bottom one is the best for drainage and for safety. And really what we're talking about is as you come off the roadway down to the bottom of the ditch, we wanna make that as flat as possible. Four to one, if you can, if not three to one, down to the bottom of the ditch. And then rather than making a V-point ditch like we might with a grader, they'd much rather we have a rounded ditch bottom because that's easier for the vehicle to get back up the back slope. And then again, the back slope, we wanna have it as flat as we can, but the four slope coming from the roadway down to the bottom of the ditch, and then that rounded ditch bottom is most critical. And so that's another best strategy that we can implement into our right-of-way maintenance. So that's removing the obstacle. Let's check out and make it traversable. Making it traversable means that a vehicle can go over it uh, without being snagged or without uh, hitting it and it make an intrusion into the cabin uh, or without turning it over. Essentially, it means that it's crash worthy. It's going to bend, yield, break, or it's low enough that it's not a problem. So how low is low enough? Well, there's a four inch maximum stub height for anything sticking up out of the ground that could be strong enough to snag a vehicle. That might be a signpost anchor. It could be a concrete headwall that is sticking up. Anything sticking up above four inches is a problem. It could be a stump where you cut down a tree and left a stump sticking up. Any of those could snag a vehicle. So in this particular case, they come in, they've removed this tree, that was a problem, but they didn't get the stump. And so we want to take that down as well. We want to get that below four inches, uh, ideally less than that, maybe even bring in a stump grinder and remove it completely. And here's a head wall that is sticking up. This is definitely going to be a problem. As it's sticking up, it's got a straight drop on the back of it. So a lot of things we could do here. We could remove that old concrete stand-up head wall. We could extend that pipe out. We could put a slope and flared metal in section or a concrete in section on that. Or we can also cut that pipe off to match the slope. And that's what they've done here. You can do that up to a, a three to one and it still be traversable. And you can do that for a pipe that has an opening of uh, 30 inches or less. And we can even do it for openings that are larger than 30 inches, but then we have to put in some pipe runners or other grading to break up that distance. And what they found is that a vehicle can cross over safely a pipe opening up to 30 inches. Now it won't be without some damage to the vehicle, but it means that they're not gonna flip or roll when they hit it. And this one has a concrete apron that is poured around the pipe after they cut it off to match the slope. 
So let's remove it. Let's make it reversible. The next is relocate it. And essentially what we're saying here is get those further away from the roadway if you can. And it could be any type of hazard for the public. Maybe it's that steep drop and you're moving it further away. Or maybe it's utility poles. And this is where right away maintenance gets into permits. When you have utility companies come in and want to put power poles on your right away, uh, hopefully you could say no and have them get over on private property. But if not, you have them put them at the back of the right away line as far away from traffic as possible. If you got the choice of whether to put it in a curve or not, you don't want to put it in the curve because remember the right of way requirements or the right of way, the clear zone requirements are more in the curve than on the straight section of roadway. And for sure, you don't want to have the power poles out in the middle of the road. Hope you find this pretty humorous. This photo comes from Canada, but evidently they built the road around the power pole and just decided to leave it there. So let's remove, let's make it traversable, relocate. Let's talk about reducing impact severity. That means that when you hit it, maybe it doesn't kill you. Might still do some damage to you, you might get injured, but it's not gonna kill you. And that brings me to signpost. Signposts are supposed to be crashworthy. Uh, when we put up a sign on a post that we install, that post needs to be crashworthy. And there we're talking about a wood post that is four by four or smaller. When they get bigger than four by four, we got to drill holes in them perpendicular to the flow of traffic to make them crash worthy to where they're going to break when someone hits them. Uh, we're also talking about the square tubing. With the square tubing, it has to be, and some people call this Telspar, that's the center photo. The square tubing needs to be two and a quarter, about two and a quarter inches or less to be considered crash worthy. And in my state, we use this along with a two and a half by two and a half inch anchor that we drive into the, the ground. And this anchor, two and a half inches by two and a half inches, is not crash worthy. That means that no more than four inches of this needs to be sticking up out of the ground. And this one's too high. If you're talking about a U channel post, if it weighs three pounds per foot or less, it is considered crash worthy. Otherwise, if it's stronger than that, we have to use a stub in the ground. And again, that stub needs to be four inches or less. Here's another one for reducing impact severity. And we're talking about right away maintenance here. How many of us have brick mailboxes within that clear zone? You know, that seven to 10, up to 46 feet from the edge of the roadway. Yeah, I'd say every hand listening probably went up because on your network, you probably got a lot of these. If you could have a policy that said these are not allowed, that you have to have something that is considered crash worthy, which would be a traditional four by four mailbox post or a one and a half inch steel strain tube, this would be a lot safer for the public because these things do get hit and they do kill people when they hit them. Here's a crash where it ended in a fatality for this person when they hit a brick mailbox. When I worked for the DOT, uh, we were not successful in taking these out. A lot of the people that own those, they have a lot of influence, so a lot of these stayed in place, unfortunately. What you could do, though, is you could talk to people when they're building them, maybe go over the liability that might be there for them and discourage them from putting them up. But that's something that's on our right of way that we could have a policy that says we're not going to let those be there. Getting close to the bottom of the list of what we do with fixed object hazards in the clear zone or uh, slope hazards in the clear zone is shield the obstacle. That's number five on the list. There we're talking about guardrail. All right, so guardrail is a barrier system or maybe a concrete barrier wall. But guardrail is not the top of the list. And the reason it's not is that guardrail itself can injure you. Guardrail itself, you know, can be a killer. So it's only used where whatever we're shielding the public from is more of a hazard than the guardrail itself. And for that reason, we have warrants for installing guardrail. 
uh, those warrants are going to say that you have a steep slope, a large depth of fill, or it's a fixed object. The Astro Roadside Design Guide has a chart that shows you based upon the slope coming off the road and the depth down to the bottom of that slope, whether or not it meets the warrants or the reasons for installing guardrail. And again, another one is fixed object. So let's say we have a bridge wall, concrete bridge wall. That's a fixed object hazard next to the roadway. If we can't do those first four options and guardrail is something we might attach to that bridge, whenever we do that, we want to make sure that the guardrail is installed properly so it's crashworthy. And we use in treatments that are crashworthy. I would also recommend that if you have guardrail that is up that is not needed, maybe it was put up uh, solely for political reasons in the past, or if you have substandard rail, that you address it. If it's substandard, you need to definitely bring it up to current standards. And that brings me back to this photo. This particular string of rail is substandard. It doesn't have offset blocks. It's not the proper height. That particular end treatment is a spearing end treatment. Uh, it's not connected to the bridge wall. It's not strengthened as you get to the bridge wall. So there's nothing about that that is standard. It's too close to the utility pole that is there behind it as well. So we would ideally come in here and replace that and bring it up to current standards. And I call that a spearing in treatment. The reason I did is because if you don't have a crashworthy in treatment, it can actually really easy easily penetrate into the vehicle. And this shows you an end treatment that has done so. This was a non-crashworthy end treatment, and you can see how it came into the vehicle, made intrusion all the way through the vehicle. And as you can imagine, the results are often devastating. Brings us down to the very last item, which is delineate the obstacle. That really means put up some type of signage to let people know at the very least that there's a problem coming up. And that's what they've done here with type three object markers. So that's a little bit about how right-of-way maintenance can help. What good right-of-way maintenance is, uh, how it can help keep the vehicles on the road, improve intersec intersection safety, and to help create that forgiving roadside. You know, and that's going to help us bring down those numbers, that thousand plus fatalities that we have each year on the roadway. And so I hope that you've enjoyed this. We talked about why the right-of-way maintenance was important. I gave you those two documents to help, the Ashto Roadside Design Guide and the Vegetation Control for Safety by the FHWA. And then we listed a whole lot of strategies for maintaining our right-of-ways. We appreciate you attending. We appreciate you watching this webinar. And please check out our website for future training opportunities and resources.